Yeah, so like Tapa said, we have a really nice turnout. Thank you everyone for joining us. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Padmini. She's an associate professor in mechanical engineering at UCSD. She joined the department in July, 2014. Uh, prior to that, she was a UC Berkeley Chancellor's postdoctoral fellow where she worked on lipid bilayer mechanics. She obtained her PhD in biological sciences from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And <clears throat> today she will share some of her latest work on modeling the structural uh, plasticity of postsynaptic spines. Let's take it away. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jungman and um, Thomas, for inviting me. This is actually my first Zoom seminar. I've done a lot of Zoom teaching. Um, I haven't done Zoom seminars. I'm very excited to actually talk about science and not class material today. Um, so by way of background, just if you've heard the sort of pre-seminar conversation, um, my group broadly works on a wide range of problems that sort of intersect uh, systems biology, uh, cell mechanics sort of space, so uh, mechanochemistry, if you will. And so today I want to talk to you guys about a project we've been working on for the last three years. This is a, a multi-PI project funded by the Air Force, um, which uh, I'm happy to talk to any of you about later on how this came about, but there was a lot of uh, luck involved for sure. And um, what I'm going to tell you today is a se sequence of stories on uh, structural plasticity of postsynaptic spines. I have deliberately kept the details of the computational aspects somewhat uh, sparse so I can tell you a story, but I'm happy to talk with you about exactly which equations were solved, how, if that is of interest, either after the seminar or offline. Um, all right, so just to get us on the same page, uh, much of what I'll be focusing on today is the, um, ooh, pointer, uh, is this little red circle in there noted as the this, as this synapse where you can see a presynaptic axon coming in contact with a neuron. Now, the parts that we have been focusing are on what is known as the postsynaptic spine that is marked at the bottom of the uh, left image. Why can't I get a pointer? Yeah, that so, yeah, what, one thing we've realized is if, if you share your entire screen, it might make it easier to uh, okay. see your mouse also. All right, let's try this. Pause share. Stop. Share. Share desktop. Okay. Yeah. Now. Yeah, now it should okay, be. Okay, now. Or not. Okay. Or All not. Right. Or not. But yeah, I we'll, still don't see your mouse. Yeah, I don't see my mouse either. But um, we, we can power through this. So the, the whole focus of today's talk is looking at the postsynaptic spine. Um, and this project, very briefly, kind of started with uh, a conversation with some of my colleagues here at UCSD thinking about energy intensive processes at the uh, in the operation of brain circuitry. Some of you may be familiar with ideas of neural computation, neuromorphic engineering, and how um, these ideas of how our brain is 2% body weight and consumes 20% of the energy versus any of the computational devices we make are much less energy efficient. In synapses, uh, cells are steadily pumping ions. Uh, this is a math biology talk, so you're all familiar with Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire type of mechanisms. And these electrical charges, these operations are extremely energy intensive. And one of the things we noticed was that there's a lot of biochemistry involved in, this, um, in the operation of the synapse, which is quite well known. And more recently, a lot of evidence about the physical rearrangement of the synapse. So thinking about all of these various aspects brought us to the notion of like being able to do a lot of mechanochemical modeling and a lot of biophysical modeling that um, takes place um, at the postsynaptic spine. And to tell you, if you kind of zoom in into that little postsynaptic spine, just to sort of think about what a spine looks like, this is about one micron cubed. Uh, a spine comes off of the dendrites that come off the axon. It's about one micron cube. And it has been touted as sort of an isolated biochemical signaling compartment uh, implicated in a lot of 
um, learning, memory, and decision making, and sleep, and things like that. And we'll we'll touch upon all of these very high level ideas very briefly. But here is how um, we think about some of the uh, details. This is a cartoon um, that my postdoc Andrea Cunha made to give us a sense of the features we care about uh, right now. You have this bulbous spine head, and this spine head has this little pink region called the postsynaptic density up top. This is this cluster of large density of proteins, like a protein matrix that is not fully uh, understood, but now we're starting to identify um, the role of uh, various protein compositions and localization. And uh, there are channels that are located on, at the postsynaptic density, uh, depolarization action potential, you end up getting a calcium influx. In addition to the calcium influx, you also have a lot of other signaling events that are um, that include second messengers like cyclic AMP and IP3. And there are two other features that we'll be revisiting um, throughout the talk. One is that the spine is a very rich, den, um, very rich in actin locally thought to have about 20 micromolar of F-actin and uh, also about 14 to 19% of spines have this specialized endoplasmic reticulum compartment known as the spine apparatus, okay? So these are our key players for this morning. And what we kind of wanted to do was think about how these different structural features and organizations um, play an important role in long-term potentiation depression. So briefly, long-term potentiation depression are associated with uh, memory and learning. Uh, LTP reinforces pathways and has been associated with increasing spine volume. Um, and LTD, long-term depression, weakens pathways um, and uh, uh, LTP is taught like update of synaptic weights and all these sort of mathematical processes that you may talk about. Um, LTP is sort of, it underlies some of these. One of the bigger picture questions that brought us into this project with uh, colleagues here on campus is thinking a lot about sleep because spine rescaling can occur during sleep, which means that over the course of learning um, memory formation, there's a lot of dynamic changes to size and shape. We tried to, uh, inspired actually by a diagram in uh, one of Rahe Yasuda's works, we tried to organize our thoughts as we got into this project into sort of mapping length scales and time scales. And essentially, if you have, like me, a fascination for signaling networks, um, you'll see that there are so many receptors acting near some, uh, at these small time scale um, you have the GS couple GPCRs and MDA receptors and MGLUARs. And MDA receptors and MGLUARs are glutamate receptors. And you have now two branches that um, can go forward. One is through calcium signaling, the other is through cyclic AMP. Uh, at the minute time scale, you have kinases, uh, PKA, CAMK2, and much of what we're trying to do in this proce process, you can see as you come towards the four to five minute time scale, you start to involve a little bit more uh, mechanics. You have AMPA receptors, which is another important receptor, and their diffusion on the surface or exocytosis, insertion clustering. And on the other hand, I mentioned the richness of actin in these spines through a cartoon nonetheless. Um, and you can start to see that a lot of mechanics starts to come into play. To be able to get to long-term potentiation at, at sort of a one hour time scale, just I find charts like these very helpful in managing my thoughts on just organizing the literature and all the pieces that are going with the disclaimer that this is quite incomplete. Still, we started somewhere and actually started thinking about calcium. Now these spines that I showed you um, actually, their calcium dynamics are fairly complex. They have a variety of re uh, receptors and channels that uh, have calcium influx into the spine, pumps uh, that take it out of the spine, and then you have the spine apparatus as a specialized ER um, is a 
calcium storage unit. The other thing that I haven't yet mentioned to you is that spines come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and they have been reasonably well characterized in terms of their high level shapes, in terms of stubby spines and thin spines with a spherical head and mushroom shaped spines, and have been correlated with some, um, some semblance of their function. And so we started actually asking what we thought um, and, and if you speak to members of my group, they'll always tell you this. We start with asking what we think is a simple question and then it kind of blows out of proportion and then we find ourselves sort of scrambling to put the pieces together. And um, what we wanted to do was, you know, look at spine function defined by calcium dynamics. Then we started putting all the sort of factors together and now you can see geometry, biochemistry, transport, all of that started to play a role. So we stepped back a lot and started asking this question. Now, this is a, a simplified uh, mathematical representation of what happens to um, calcium dynamics in a spine and how does shape matter? Does shape matter? We don't know if shape matters. Let's find out. The first equation you see up there is a simple uh, reaction diff diffusion equation. All reactions are represented by a simple time scale and you have diffusion and the volume. C is the concentration. The various fluxes that I showed you, actually the, the mathematical problem here is one of um, time dependent, spatially dependent boundary conditions. All those channels whose fluxes we know essentially constitute a flux boundary condition at the, member, at the plasma membrane, the PM here, that is time dependent. And all of the ER um, influxes and effluxes are time dependent uh, boundary conditions, uh, flux boundary conditions of the ER. And you can try to solve uh, these equations analytically. Um, we have done some of that in this paper. And what you will start to see is when you start playing with geometric variables like the radius of the spine head, which is R0, and the radius of the spine apparatus, which is Ri, so, and you just play with this simple system, um, you start to get very different behaviors depending on the um, eccentricities of these ellipsoids that you're seeing up here and uh, the inner and the ratio of the inner and the outer eccentricities. I show you this, um, if, if you're familiar with uh, solving these types of PDEs, what we're looking at are various harmonic solutions that one can get depending on the boundary conditions. But once I show you these as a proof of principle uh, on how geometry can play a role, but once you start actually adding in the specific details, you can see that now the uh, boundary conditions at the PM and the uh, uh, spine apparatus gets a, get much more complicated because each of those J terms on the bottom uh, right corner of this slide are nonlinear terms. And there have been many models developed and parametrized for each of these terms. Um, in the mathematical biology literature. So now our stimulus in this case, so we tried to go from a very simple phenomenological toy model, if you will, into a more uh, detailed model of um, looking at calcium dynamics. Here we kept our geometries um, still somewhat um, tractable in, in the sense that we could first uh, run these calculations in finite element, uh, commercially available finite element frameworks without having to rewrite a whole lot of code. Um, second, uh, we can have some geometric intuition on how spheres versus ellipsoids may uh, behave. So our stimulus here is now a change in the membrane voltage, um, as you can see in the top right corner. And when you work your way through this, and there are many detailed permutations and combinations of these simulations. The key thing to see is that the spine volume plays a very important role in the calcium dynamics. And for a given a spine, and you see differences in the peak calcium in spheres and ellipsoids. And I'm doing my student, Miriam Bell, who, who did a lot of this work, a lot of injustice by taking about two years worth of work and sticking it on one slide, but I kind of want to keep with the telling you the story theme here um, 
but this then leads us to other things that we can do that um, I think are very exciting. But once you go through the pain of populating models with some level of biochemical detail, you can actually start to ask questions about the roles of different channels. And so, for example, if you just had voltage-sensitive calcium channel um, on the uh, spine head, as opposed to if you just had NMDA receptors, you can see the relative contributions of those fluxes, both in time and in, as a function of geometry. And you can see here that the voltage-sensitive calcium channel gives you the higher peak and a rapid decay, and the NMDA receptors gives you a lower peak and a little bit more prolonged effect in terms of the timescales. And so you can start to parse out um, the role of differential um, control of information and the number of these channels uh, is starting to be documented from experiments. And so you can sort of fill in that parameter space and make predictions at this time. All right. So this sort of brings us to something that our high level goal was looking closer and closer towards energetics. And one of the reasons we kind of got into that was the role played by the mitochondria. So I'm gonna show you something uh, here that is very new, very exciting to me and to my student, Alan. And um, I will also admit, because I know some of my group members are here and I'm not, I'm just gonna say this, don't make your slides the night before, but I did that. The next three slides, I made the slides the night before just because of how excited I'm to share, share this with you. So what you're looking at here is uh, work from G Gia Volod, uh, Boyles, who shows that uh, in this paper from a while ago now that ER tubes in um, mitochondria they sort of, uh, you can see the ER tubes wrap around the mitochondria. And this is one of the early pieces of evidence of um, ER mitocontacts. This work was in the context of mitochondrial division, which we're not gonna talk about, but if you look in panel, uh, the third column, panel C, you see that red region, that's the site of ER mitocontact. We have a separate uh, set of projects on mitochondrial geometry and uh, mitochondrial lipid composition with Edi Budin, but what I'm gonna talk to you about in the context of calcium right now is what does calcium uh, dynamics and ER mitocontact have to do with each other? So there was this uh, beautiful review that uh, just a couple of years ago now that sort of gives you the sense of how these contacts may perhaps localize all of these channels regulate the uh, mitochondrial potential and um, maybe have some effects locally. Separately, um, there is increasing evidence for the presence of ER mitocontacts along the dendrites. The mitochondria in the postsynapse are sort of parked along the dendrites. And so what um, the work initiated by my former postdoc, Danya, um, extremely well trans model part. So yes. what, what Alan did was he came up with a way to represent now in, these, uh, in this geometry, how we can think about uh, simulating calcium dynamics in um, using these different organelles. So I will tell you as we walk through this that there is a lot of work done on mitochondrial ATP production in different contexts. Much of it is in well-mixed models um, focusing on the sort of dynamical features. To build a full spatial model um, brings, into, uh, brings into necessity not just these boundary conditions that we're talking about, but also considering the different geometries that one would want to think about. So we decided to keep things idealized where we have uh, a segment of a dendrite with two spines, one that's a little bit larger and that can incorporate a spine apparatus. The purple region on top is the postsynaptic density. And then you have these ER tubules going through the dendrite at the bottom that are in green, the mitochondria in blue, and then this gray ring that is going around. It's simply a, 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 a torus that sort of connects the uh, ER and the mitochondria sort of like little compartments. So that's what's shown here in 
a blue in uh, that's labeled Merck. Okay, so if you take, now what you have is a couple system of partial differential equations in multiple compartments with a variety of boundary conditions, all of which are time dependent fluxes. And if you actually, um, let me just emphasize that getting this, six pictures that you're seeing. Getting these sorts of results to converge in uh, finite element methods is non-trivial. And separately with our collaborator, Ali Bezadan, who is at Cal State uh, Sacramento, we are working on proving that some of these are actually convergent and I'm not just showing you uh, numerical artifacts. So what we have here is that when you have a, a glutamate stimulus, over time, you see the spine head. So we're stimulating the larger spine. You see the larger spine over time. This is going from one, milli, one second to about 60 seconds. Light up, and then slowly the neighboring spine lights up. And similarly, on the bottom row, you're looking at the IP3 dynamics. Um, and in fact, if you look at different locations of the stimulated spine and the neighboring spine, you can see that because of the nature of the stimulus that we're providing, which is a frequency of one hertz, you can see these differences in calcium at the three different locations of the head, neck, and the shaft, whereas the neighboring spine not only has a lower calcium concentration, but also has a, a less discernible gradient, if you will. Similarly, so for the IP3 dynamics in the, in the stimulated spine and the neighboring spine, you see these effects, except uh, in the neighboring spine, the shaft has higher IP3 concentration than the head. And that's because IP3 is primarily produced in the simulated spine. The rest of it is just diffusion before it degrades. This was setting up some of the logical features we want to think about, but we were mostly interested in organelle behaviors here. So if you look at mitochondrial calcium um, in the conditions with and without the mito-ER contacts, what you see is that in the presence of the um, um, mito-ER contacts, marks for, uh, that we, uh, we just used the abbreviation marks, you have a high concent higher concentration of mitochondrial calcium. And that is simply because those contacts are forming channels or conduits through which you can have the direct influx of calcium into the mitochondria. The ER calcium is not that significantly altered in uh, with or without marks. And that makes sense if you think about how much, how large the concentration of calcium is in the ER and how those contacts are not really changing the uh, dynamics of the ER uh, calcium. On the other hand, um, perhaps most interestingly for us, the Merck calcium in the situation where you have those, those little contacts, the Merck calcium is actually locally quite high which allows us to start to bring about some predictions and ideas that Merck uh, may serve as sort of micro domains of calcium localization and signaling, if you will. Then when we actually looked at the ATP production uh, in these two geometries, where really the difference is that gray ring that I talked to you about uh, with four contacts, what we see is that with mito ER contacts, you have a significantly higher ATP production in the, um, uh, in, in the mitochondria as compared to without the marks. And the cytosolic ATP also not only has different dynamics, but also has a higher uh, ATP. So we're starting to, like I said, um, this is sort of really fresh results um, of, of a lot of hard work and you know, numerical issues that we've been sort of working our way through. And we're very excited about this because it allows us to explore just what are really small boundaries, what kinds of impacts they can have on the signaling dynamics. Padmini, yes. in, these, in these figures, is the important part kind of the transient dynamics near the beginning, this initial burst, or should I be focusing on the kind of steady state that it looks like without the Merck is sort of uh, reaching a different level? So I think the um, important thing here is the initial transient. Um, another thing that we have to sort of calculate out is the um, total ATP produced sort of area under the curve, if you will. 
and uh, we are working our way through the analysis. But thank you, that's a very good point. Because our stimulus is within, um, if you recall, our stimulus kind of is uh, done doing its thing by 10 seconds. So um, the initial burst responds to the stimulus and then you have a um, delayed uh, reset because of the spatial aspects of the model. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So moving forward, I want to put in a plug here for another aspect. So one thing that I told you earlier was that spines were very small. Uh, and then I proceeded to show you uh, solutions of different uh, of differential equations that were formulated from a deterministic viewpoint. Um, we did that and we continue to do that because I think that helps us build some intuition on how we can think about shapes and geometries and things like that. But I want to put in a plug here for uh, a paper we're writing up now with Mason Holst on looking at how we can think of um, spine calciums in a um, stochastic viewpoint. And so we have been, this work is by, uh, led by Mason Holst, who is an exceptional uh, high school student. He's a rising senior and uh, he has used the remote school environment to basically work with us on building these models. And what we, we have here is essentially he's translated the PDE model that I showed you from Miriam's paper into a sort of uh, multi-state elementary reactions and simple bimolecular chemical reactions to build a stochastic model. And we even have some preliminary uh, results to share where I can tell you that because you have now multiple runs with, diff uh, with uh, different uh, randomizations, you can see first that your, the stochastic effects are important and that the shape of the spine actually plays a role in these transients. So you can see the difference in the transients in the mushroom and the spherical spines. Um, I would not interpret too much into these results just yet because they're very preliminary. But I also wanted to sort of put in a plug for, uh, you know, uh, rising scientists who can sort of learn and code things offline. And it's been very exciting to, to be working with Mason on this project. All right, that's the calcium story. Um, I wanted to say that we've done a bunch of work on cyclic AMP dynamics. Danya Ahadi did a lot of this work um, that, I, that was published uh, late last year. I'm not going to go over that because I want to get us to the shape and act and park and how we think about it. I'll tell you a little bit briefly though on how we kind of get to act and, and a key player in between, which is CAMK2. So CAMK2, um, CAM, calcium, uh, the calmodulin kinase II, um, has a very interesting and rich history in synaptic plasticity. And in fact, a very rich set of models in uh, mathematical biology, because in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was perpetrated as a molecular marker of memory. And so there were many models that came out proposing by stability of um, CAMK2 uh, with high CAMK2 phosphorylation being important for LTP and uh, low um, CAMK2 phosphorylation being important for LTD and the role of the protein phosphatase one in sort of tuning these dynamics. And um, what we started looking into was uh, one of the factors that Mary Kennedy, our collaborator on this work raised, was that there was no evidence, no experimental evidence of the sort of bistable behavior and um, what could be the underlying features of CAMK2 implications. So this is work that actually came out last week in PLOS Computational Biology led by Mariam Arja, a very talented postdoc in the group. And what she did was actually set out to deal with the various um, aspects of CAMK2 um, dynamics. Now, I told you this entire time, LTP is multi-scale, but if you look at the single molecule CAMK2, it is also quite um, interesting and multi-scale in nature because it's um, often a dodecamer 
and it relies on calcium calmodulin binding to activate it. And cal calcium calmodulin itself is a very interesting cooperative uh, scaffolding protein because you need about four calciums to uh, activate calmodulin. There's a lot of steps involved that we took into account here. And I'm essentially doing, Mariam, a great disservice by putting all of the model building efforts that we did for about two years into saying rule-based modeling of CAMK2 monomers and holoenzymes using BioNergen. But if you'll afford me that liberty, let me tell you that what we found were a few very exciting things. One is that if you look at the phosphor CAMK2 dynamics, in response to the free calcium over time, which is the little inset in green, you see that if you, the amount of phosphocam K2 obviously depends on how much calmodulin there is in the system. But if you have an additional scaffolding protein called neurogranin, then that neurogranin plays a big role in sort of tamping down the CAM K2 holoenzyme uh, dynamics. And uh, you can actually look, if you look at the individual trends, which is panel B over here, uh, and you have uh, actually about 100 pulses in the bottom green panel, what you see is that for the individual calcium transient if in panel B, if you follow the bottom panel B, if you follow the blue curve, then the uh, corresponding blue solid line of the CAMK2 is a sort of stepwise increase, but the step in each case is not of the same height. And this is true for each of the individual transients. And so essentially what we have is thinking about CAMK2 essentially as a leaky integrator of the calcium signals uh, because of the change in the step size. And when you have scaffolding proteins like neurogranin, they actually tune the leak rate. So we haven't, despite taking all the detailed molecular interactions, we haven't found evidence for this bistability of um, CAMK2 in this model. And we are now exploring extensions, but I can tell you that a, a seemingly benign scaffolding protein seems to alter one of the key properties of CAMK2 in terms of it being a leaky integrator. And there was uh, some experimental evidence for this in a paper last year by Rohe Yasuda, who actually showed that uh, the stepwise kinetics is observed for CAMK2 in spines. And so this sort of brings us to the sort of close of the signaling portion of all the features we talked about in terms of these different molecules and their multi-scale and how you can think about the sensitivity um, in the spine of calcium. All right, so we, I can pause for questions and then switch to sort of the more mechanical aspects that we're thinking about. If anybody has any pressing questions on this sort of first one minute of LTP that we've only sort of started scratching the surface on. So I guess the, the picture I should have in mind is that this uh, CAM K2 is kind of counting or somehow keeping track of the number of, say, uh, neurotransmitters that have been detected by the, by the spine. Is that, is that right or no? So, yes, partially. So you can think of CAM K2 as keeping track of the number of free calcium that enter the spine. Um, and then what does it do with, with this? How does it pass it along then? Right. I guess this so is the actin that's, story. That's the actin story. Are there any other questions? I see that uh, Paul Miller also uh, shared a reference with us on role of the neurogranin concentrated in spines in the induction of long-term potentiation. Okay, is that in the chat? I can look at it. It's in the chat, yeah. Okay, I'll look at the chat. Thank you, Paul, but I'll look at the chat in a second. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we'll sort of switch gear to thinking about the um, actin story. So why did we build all of this level of detail? So we want to think about actin reorganization in spines, and that is a big, messy problem, as with anything that has actin in it. And there has been some work done in terms of how actin arranges itself, uh, actin is arranged 
in the spine, whether uh, it is a, a series of long bundled filaments in the neck or small uh, short branched filaments. Uh, there is work done by Tatiana Sutkina on a lot of EM imaging. Um, but essentially, uh, this schematic sets the stage for what we want to think about in terms of actin um, distribution in the spines, if you will. And the reason why we were looking at CAMK2 is because our hope is that we can uh, start to piece a lot of these things together. So the thing is, CAMK2, when it's unphosphorylated, it actually bundles actin. And when you have this calcium influx, uh, as Thomas was just asking, and you have the um, and phosphorylation of CAMK2, phosphorylated CAMK2 um, results in effactin unbundling. And as a result of this, this filamentous actin is now free to polymerize, uh, remodel, and um, you know, result in spine enlargement. And so when the CAMK2 is then dephosphorylated, you can have uh, effactin bundling again, but there is a um, strong uh, relationship between the calcium influx. If you look at the bottom left, this little panel, the calcium influx and the time scale of CAMK2 phosphorylation versus uh, bundling, effactin, spine volume, and things like that. So this is kind of where we aspire to go. And we also have access to some exceptional data from our uh, colleague Shelley Halpain on the role of molecules like cofilin and limb kinase in uh, changing spine area. So actin is critical. If you go beyond calcium, actin dynamics are critical in thinking about shape and structural plasticity. So in my title, I use structural plasticity. And so it, this is a good time to define it. When you talk about synaptic plasticity, it involves not just changes to all of these molecules we're talking about, but also changes to the size and shape. Uh, and this is termed structural plasticity. So we wanted to sort of build these pieces, but again, we took two approaches. One is uh, thinking about what are the energetics of uh, keeping the, um, of, of building certain shapes, okay? So if you want to have a stubby shape or a mushroom shape, what are the energetics of those? So you can just think about this in terms of writing an energy balance where you say there is an energy cost to bending a membrane. And in this case, perhaps it's not just fair to call it a plasma membrane, but more of a sort of membrane cortical, um, a thicker membrane than the plasma membrane. And then you have all this work done by actin forces. And we said we can think about this as a sort of energy minimization problem because it happens at a, at a different time scale. And so if you integrate the total energy of the system, and I'll explain the terms in, that is the W, and you minimize it, you might be able to get the shape. This is just the principle of virtual work. So the, um, there's a term missing here, but I'll tell you that this W, which is the energy density per unit area, is it's simply the Helfrich bending energy, if you're familiar with that. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, all that is saying is that the energy cost to bend the membrane depends on its mean curvature H and its Gaussian curvature K and um, the membrane tension lambda. And then you can think about the force, um, the energy change due to the actin as the work done. And so you, you basically take the, both these terms and you minimize the energy and you can get some shapes. And the motivation for thinking about this is essentially now, rather than prescribing the shapes to see what are the energetics of trying to get these shapes. And so we have now uh, thin spines that may have the spherical head with a long neck, uh, or you have these mushroom shaped spines, which are thought to be more stable. They are right protected memory spines that have this little depression where they often wrap around an axon. So we classified a lot of these shapes based on the literature. In fact, Kristen Harris and colleagues uh, and Rafa Yuste, they've done a lot of work on sort of getting at these ultrastructure of spines. And as we sort of made our list of items we wanted to look at, it became obvious that the plasma membrane, the uh, actin interactions, and these constriction proteins at the neck were gonna play a very important role. So we simplified a lot of our um, geometric features 
and uh, identified some ranges of uh, value, values of these um, head volume and spine neck and things like that. And essentially what you're looking at now is an axisymmetric framework um, where we are simulating shapes along the solid yellow line. Um, and I'll show you how we do that. And then uh, we obtain shapes in response to different applied forces, uh, membrane tension to get a sense of what are the forces involved in these uh, uh, different geometries. All right, so if you're familiar with any of this helfric uh, type modeling at all, first I can tell you that if you're trying to form a phylopodia-like spine, which is sort of an early uh, sort of spine sort of seeking its space out, then you can recover some of the classic relationships that the radius of the spine depends on the bending modulus kappa and the tension lambda. And uh, our simulations match these analytical results. Um, this is more a proof of principle showing that indeed our models work as one would expect them to work. But if you actually start thinking about thin spines where you want to get this spherical head, the previous mechanical models focused on some notion of an osmotic pressure, but there's no evidence that there is any osmotic pressure effects in these uh, spines. And so rather what we have is a distributed normal force acting on these spines. And now you can basically relate the spine neck radius to the bending modulus and the tension primarily, but also the required normal force to the um, area of the applied force and the tension. And you can get um, analytical insights into some of these fairly complex um, shapes that one might see. In fact, if you look at mushroom shape geometries, despite the uh, complexity of the shape, the radius of the neck still holds the same relationship. But you can start to see that the force applied that is normal in the head versus now we are including the PSD region is um, similar in its trend with respect to tension, but a little bit different in terms of the actual quantity. And if you vary these forces and you vary the area of the PSD and the area of the head, you can actually get a variety of shapes that you see in the bottom, in panel C in the bottom where you can see this cup-like depression, which if you've looked at red blood cell shapes and these different uh, geometries, it reminds you of that as opposed to a more smooth um, head over there. Again, very new results that we are working on. This is work done by my student, Hale Ali Mohammadi, um, who has actually uh, been working on membrane mechanics for her entire PhD. But one of the things, well, this, this continuum description gives you a sense of the uh, forces itself. One of the things that we haven't put in is the actin mechanics. Uh, this work that I'm going to show you is now done by Chris Lee, who's an extremely talented postdoc in my group, with uh, Justin Oshiro, who is an undergrad, and Andrew Nguyen, who was an undergrad and will be an incoming grad student right about now. And what we're trying to do is get in these molecular details of actin, where you have the treadmilling features, the branching and the severing and the capping proteins, incorporating the um, uh, Brownian ratchet feature in the spine head. Okay, so we're basically building up piece by piece, puzzle by puzzle in the computer. Uh, the way we do this is we use this framework known as Cytosm. And Cytosm is, uh, was developed by Francois Nerlich um, and is a very robust tool for simulating. Um, filament mechanics, and uh, it uses constrained Langevin dynamics. And I will just put in a plug here for our work using cytosine that Matt Akamatsu did for endocytosis. And I put this movie here not because it's relevant to spines, because you can actually see clearly how uh, these um, uh, actin filaments grow around a surface where in purple you have ARP23 um, um, sorry, you have here actin linkers, and then in the blue are the R23. And if I let this run, you can actually see an actin meshwork form and invaginate the uh, endocytic pit. What we did 
was we wanted to use the same framework. Now the challenge is in this framework, what you're seeing this movie of Acton is the, the Acton is not enclosed. So it turns out trying to stick anything into an enclosed geometry and not have the Acton break your mesh and get a seg fault is not trivial at all. And this is where this amazing team, they basically not only managed to do it, but also managed to make it make sense. So what we're doing now is taking those geometries that I showed you from Halle's work, right? So we have these idealized geometries and we have now a working, a working version of Cytosim where it, the uh, R23 is first on, on the plasma membrane, you have actin seeds and you have uh, capping proteins in there. And in fact, you can see these beautiful filaments form uh, in, the, in the cytosome simulation where you can start to see that the uh, R23 is moving now. In fact, it's better seen here. The R23 is moving with the branch into the um, uh, volume. And in fact, if you, it also then depends on the shape. Obviously in phyllopodial spines, the branches are pretty much everywhere. Whereas in spherical uh, heads in a mushroom shapes, head, the R23 is moving more inwards into these uh, sort of, um, uh, towards the center of the cytosome. Okay, so, my point here is that we now have the technology and we can now explore the different um, hypotheses of the role of, let's say, the amount of capping proteins or ARP23 or cofilin and how they may play a role. What does the spine apparatus have to do with the actin branching and things like that? All right, one last plug-in um, for another technology we are developing. Can I, can I pause for a second and just yes. ask? Sure. Uh, um, so, like a couple. This is really cool. I love the way um, you can separate all the things that I've always um, struggled from the, the, the complications of the, the actual in vivo system. For example, like that the ion channels are regulated by um, uh, actin-dependent endocytosis. So when you perturb actin generally, you mess up all the earlier steps in your yes. process. I, I, I love this, but um, I'm curious whether. Um, treating the spine head as sort of an isotropically growing thing given the um, non-isotropic localization of, for example, cell adhesion molecules and how that's going to yeah. change. Have you, have you played around with um, those kinds of geometries or can you get those cup-shaped features and things without ever considering that there's, you know, this nanoscale organization of cell adhesion right at the um, CSC? So we can get those. We haven't thought about the uh, cell adhesion, we can, we can do those. We can do a lot of those. I think one of the things that we found was the, like you said, this big gap between the complexity of the system and then the sort of um, complexity of the technologies required even to simulate it. I mean, we talk a lot about reductionist uh, biology, but even in, this, the, in the same vein in the, in the computational space, um, coding something like this, I mean, I'm just fascinated by this movie and I, I must admit I've been watching it way too many times and now I'm subjecting you guys to it. It's, it's, a, it's such a non-trivial coding effort yeah, to get I'm something, not. yeah, to get something like this to work. But now that we have this working, I think there are two pieces to this. One is to, to sort of publicize the method so that more and more of the computational community comes in and starts contributing to these. And then to get into like, you know, what are the interesting experimental questions that one can think about? You know, what if we localized ARP23 only in a certain region? You know, what, what, what happens when you have cofilin? And so we have a lot of, I think, uh, ability uh, to generate a lot of uh, hypothesis testing and prediction. Yeah, yeah but we're fun. sort of breaking it up into pieces. It would be fun to get sort of uh, input from the community. Uh, you know, what would be the, the most uh, interesting things to try? Um, like, you know, Homer, for example, would be uh, yeah. something to really change these dynamics or like you said, where the RP3 is activated. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And yeah, I have a follow-up question just about what's actually happening in the simulation. Here you you prescribe the shape of the spine, right? So it's kind of a one-way coupling. Uh, yes. You prescribe the, the geometry and then see the actin dynamics, but presumably those, those things are coupled. Yes, that's coming up. Uh, Sun Cheng somewhere in the audience is working on it. Uh, so let me, 
right let yeah it's, it's a good it's a good starting point yeah. i just wanted to yeah. so i think here what we want to do is so the act and dynamics are perhaps are going to get us to sort of the key things I want to get at is if you have a given shape, what is what are the possible actin configurations you can fill it with? And then you can now go back to the calcium question and say, you know, how does calcium actually diffuse through this? It's like diffusing through uh, a maze, right? It's not diffusing through an empty space. So there's, a, so there's that part, and then how do you get the spine to change its shape? And I'll show you a little bit of what uh, we're getting towards here, which is this part of the talk, which is what we next wanna consider is realistic geometries. And um, I'll be very brief here, but one of the things that I wanted to highlight is just how much 3D EM data is coming out of uh, the neuroscience community on synapses, synaptic connections, you know, Janelia Farms has tons of data, Christian Harris has data, Mark Ellisman at UCSD has data, Uri Manor has data. And so one of the, so why do we need idealized geometries? Why can't we work with these geometries? So what you're looking at here in this movie is from Pietro Di Camille's lab. This is a paper they published in PNAS, where as you're going in and out of the movie, you're seeing the spine, uh, which is outlined in teal and the spine apparatus that is outlined in yellow. And you can see these geometries are oh so complicated. So can we actually do something with these geometries? So this is where Chris and Justin Laughlin actually um, started, uh, let's get to this part, started thinking about using these geometries for meshing and simulation, right? So this is, um, if you take these native geometries uh, and try to mesh them, you do not get meshes that are compatible with um, any finite element method that you want to use. You see that little fan-shaped elongated triangle at the bottom half and you know, your simulations are not going to converge. So much of our effort on this part was spent, at least for me, coming from a very traditional differential equation background, learning things about meshing algorithms, mesh conditioning, um, work done this with uh, Michael Holst, um, on sort of developing a framework to be um, able to get high quality meshes. And I'll put in a plug here for uh, Gamer2. Um, it's available on GitHub. Uh, if you are in the space of 3D EM, uh, I would encourage you to use it and please give us feedback. So you can see that the, on the uh, leftmost side is the, is the first mesh that you generate and processing it through Gamer gives you now a mesh that is uh, much more refined, it's, it's conditioned, it is now adaptable for finite and element simulations, and we also have boundary marking in there. What that means is that we can designate regions as purple as the PSD and have specific boundary conditions on there and the non-PSD regions. So um, where, to answer Thomas's question, where we want to go in he with here is first have these actin simulations in these realistic geometries. Second, have uh, the actin be coupled with a moving mesh. And this moving mesh problem is a very complex computational problem. Um, I have scars from trying to make some of that work in my own PhD thesis, which was a while ago now. But um, I can tell you that we are working with uh, folks in the graphics community in Sunchang, my PhD student is working on using discrete differential geometry methods for the membrane to be able to deform these meshes locally. And as a proof of principle, we have a full branch of dendrite and here we are, simula uh, we are stimulating them with the action potential and you can see that we have preliminary results on calcium influxes on these different spines. Uh, and just to show you that we are thinking about beyond the single spine, beyond the idealized geometries and running a lot of simulations. Um, and this has been a lot of fun working on. We're only just getting started. And the, all the work that I've shown here, um, my group will attest to this fact. I'll just come up with, hey, let's do this, you know, and send them a Slack message and they'd be like, okay. Um, and so the folks highlighted in blue, it's their work I've specifically shown. But I also want to give a big shout out to the group um, overall. Um, 
ranging from high school students, Mason and Jesse, all the way to uh, postdocs um, who have been incredible, incredible in essentially moving our entire research enterprise remotely. And as a computational group, we would probably be the last people to go back in. But every day they remind me of what is the most exciting thing to be doing and how we can keep powering. And I'm very grateful for that more than anything else. Our collaborators who are amazing um, partners to work with on these really crazy ideas and uh, funding, of course, uh, from the Air Force. And back in the day when you could do this without taking a mask, without wearing a mask or actually hang out, this was our group picture circa November 2019. And uh, we look forward to when we can do that again. So with that, I will uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for this nice talk. Um, yeah, so please feel free to ask questions if there are any. I'm just curious about, so this uh, simulation you showed on the actual sort of uh, branch of the, of the dendrite was really beautiful. Could you say a little bit more about sort of, uh, what you're kind of trying to capture here, what the main, main yeah, uh, so target this of the simulation The simulation is? was basically us trying to see it was a few things. Technically, it was us trying to see. So historically, as I mentioned, I have not, I was not a computation person, right? So I used MATLAB. And then uh, if there was a built-in solver for something, I was happy with it because I, 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 I was and remain a paper and pen kind of uh, math biology person. And this simulation is showing a few things. One, it is showing that we have now with the meshes generated from Gamer, the ability to take these complex large geometries and run finite element simulations with the boundary marking and the boundary conditions and everything I showed you uh, in Phoenix. Uh, that was one of our main points. Uh, from a biological perspective, it is showing to some extent that spine size, uh, spine head size and shapes matter quite a bit for calcium dynamics but this was this simulation was already done like two years ago and i'm sure with all the advances we now have with the er and the mitochondria if we went back and revisited this we'd get much more insight and so here you're solving the diffusion equation over this surface we are solving the diffusion equation in the volume on the surface we have the flux boundary conditions that respond to different channels and uh, pumps thank you beautiful yeah i like watching movies they make me happy Any further questions? I guess I can stop sharing now. Um, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, I guess we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here um, if there's nothing else. So, um, yeah, I'd like to thank the speaker again. Thank you so much for taking the time to give a presentation. Um, and yeah, and that's, this is the last math bio meeting for the, for the summer. So um, we'll reconvene sometime in the fall. And um, yeah, thank you all for participating again. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Padmini. Thanks. Bye.